I told you this is You're now but trouble. We're all suffering because of your poor attitude. You're just a boss's man, I tell you. Oh, don't give me that rot. I've covered for your poor work and you've been late twice this week. It's your own fault, Rex. Shut your mouth, I'm coughing! Get your hands off me, you dick! Get off me! I love you, Redford! I'll get you! You get what's coming to you one day, Redford! Thomas Redfern, 28. Derby silk mill worker and married father of two young sons. During the 1830s, many mill workers started working from the age of five. In fact, here at the silk mill, um, by the 1840s, it was recorded that the entire workforce was under the age of 18. The living conditions and, and food for workers was often very, very poor. Um, even though there were many improvements during the 19th century, the poorest workers often never felt the benefit of these. Uh, lateness and, and shoddy work often resulted in, in reductions in wages or the docking of wages or even severe beatings. But things were beginning to change. The first Derby Union Lodge opened at the Pheasant Public House on Bridge Street, Derby in October 1833. In Derby, uh, there had been a long history of trade union organisation around trades and the reason why this particular new form of trades union, as they called it, was set up at this time uh, is probably because of the disappointment felt after the, uh, the failure of the Reform Act a couple of years previous uh, to, uh, to enfranchise the workers and it was inclusive of, uh, uh, of people in a way that the old trade unions hadn't been in that uh, it encouraged men and women to join, it encouraged people from all trades and no trade as long as they were workers they were welcome. Repeat after me. I do. I do. Before Almighty God and this local lodge. Before Almighty God and this local lodge. Most solemnly swear. Well, the union was uh, very successful uh, right from the start. Um, within five weeks of, uh, of the lodge opening in Derby, there were over 700 workers that had uh, become members, and part of the joining process was taking a secret oath. Welcome to the union. They made sure that uh, this oath uh, would be frightening to the masters in the way that they did it. However, the masters refused to be intimidated by the union's attempts to dictate working practices. Did you want to do this? Hey, I'm not paying you for this. There's nothing wrong with it. You pay his doc. There's nothing wrong with it, is there? You can't take money from me. Get out! No, I'm not going anywhere. Get rid of him, now. Oh. Get off me! Get off me! Get rid of her too! I won't stand for this insolence! Do you all hear me? The mill workers had grown weary of their masters and began to take a stand. Not just in this mill, but in others all over the region. It was the start of an uprising, and evidence suggests it began here in Derby. Well, the workers had a fight on their hands. Uh, four days later, the, uh, the mill owners organised their own meeting. If the workers have the right to withhold their labour, then we too have the right to withhold our employment. You're right. Profits in, in mills had risen by over 400% in, in the preceding 40 years. Um, and mill owners were very, very threatened by the um, rise of, of the union movement as mill workers began to get together and to fight for their their working conditions and other rights. They want to regulate the price and the hours of their labour. They want to abolish the piecework. That will reward the idle and the unskilled worker. Exactly. The members of the union have sworn an oath. We must stop this before it goes too far. Each the mill owners and masters months. drew up a document which they each signed and published in the local and national newspapers. Large number of Derby workers out. Owners lock out union. 
Well, the mill owners had uh, seen how this sort of trade union activity could uh, damage business elsewhere in the country, and uh, they didn't want their workers to be dictating uh, the working practices to them here in Derby. Well, through the use of the documents, within three days, uh, the mill owners had cleared their mills of trades unionists and people connected to the union who might want to support it in some way. Hey, you! Out! Now! Why me? I'm not part of the unions! Yes, but the men in your family are union men. See that she leaves. Now! <laughs> Across the town, over a thousand workers were subjected to this heavy-handed treatment, causing bitter resentment and unrest. The mayor in, in Derby swore in a large number of special constables and a unit of dragoon guards was stationed within the town. Many of the workers saw this as, as a provocation and a threat to their livelihoods. However, in this case, uh, it was quite a, a, a peaceful uh, event and uh, there was very little violence recorded. And by the end of December, there were about 1,500 workers locked out for refusing to sign the document to say that they weren't members of the trades union. And these were people from all sorts of trades, not just the silk trades. This was supported by the trades union press, especially the newspaper The Pioneer, which organised uh, them getting money sent to them to support the endeavours of the locked out workers of Derby from all over the country. Money donated to Derby's locked out workers. The mill workers didn't need to return to work because they were being supported by the unions. So the mill owners had to resort to uh, recruiting workers from outside of Derby, from as far away as London and elsewhere. I've heard that Frost's bringing in workers from Notts and Leicester. This was because uh, the lockout was so uh, solidly supported by the people of Derby that they couldn't get anybody local to do any work for them. These black leg or black sheep workers uh, were much hated by the people of Derby. Well, black sheep was, uh, was simply a term that was commonly used for what we'd now call scabs or strike breakers uh, at the time, and it wasn't something that was specific to Derby. It was something which was commonly used uh, throughout um, and had been used for a long time. Hey, you should have been there yesterday. My missus got some of the women folk together to hurl abuse at them. It's called them black sheep started buying at them. <laughs> <laughs> I bet that didn't go down too well. There were several instances where women in particular were um, harassing the black sheep to try and stop them from breaching the lockout. Black like sheep! <laughs> One such incident was uh, where a woman was uh, described by the magistrate's court as uh, calling black sheep at people and going bar, bar, bar. And as a result, uh, she got a heavy fine. You have each been fined three shillings and sixpence. All right, then, come on, dig deep. There was so much support for the women from the people of Derby that there was a whip round in the magistrate's court, which easily covered the cost of their fines. Most of the unrest that took place in Derby was caused by the masters bringing in these workers from out of town. The feeling against the black sheep workers was so strong that there was often fights and unrest between them and the locked out workers. Well, the most serious incident of violence that took place in the whole uh, of the five or six months of the dispute uh, was when uh, um, some black sheep uh, were coming back from the pub and uh, uh, they met somebody who they believed to be a locked out worker and they thought uh, it's, uh, it's time for some retribution and they stabbed him. Although it turned out that he wasn't actually a locked out worker, he was an innocent hawker. Um, the magistrates at the time initially sentenced this black sheep to death, but that was commuted to transportation for life, and that was reduced to seven years transportation. Then it's finally not recorded what he actually uh, um, was sentenced to, and there were rumours at the time that he just walked free and didn't have anything. And of course, uh, 
the masters would have seen him as being uh, one of their people that they'd want to protect. Despite efforts to arrange an agreement between the mill owners and the trade union members, the struggle continued over the coming months, with neither side giving ground. There was, however, a small victory for the unions. The Shrovetide football match in Derby was an extremely popular event. Um, each year, many workers would join the teams um, in, in what was almost a, a legalised um, riot um, from one end of the town to the other. It was sort of like the, uh, the Ashbourne Shrovetide football match of today where uh, um, people uh, start at one end of town that are uh, uppers and uh, start at the other end of town that are downers and uh, they try and get it from one end of the town to the other and there aren't any other rules other than that pretty much. The local militia and magistrates had been trying to stop the event for, for a number of years but it was such a popular event that, that they had failed to do so. The locked out workers decided that as a show of strength and solidarity um, that they would stop it that year and uh, they wouldn't have it. Instead of that, they'd organise marches uh, to outlying villages in order to show their solidarity, their strength, and in order to gain support from the, uh, from the local people. It worked very well. Riot down! Riot down! We'll march. And when they see our numbers, they will know we will die before we back down. Yes! Yeah! Yeah! Yeah, I've been saying all along now. And this isn't just about today. We're doing this for our children. Yeah! The first march to Duffield um, included more than 2,000 marchers um, from a variety of trades, including carpentry, joinery, shoemakers, bricklayers, um, textile workers too. Um, men, women and children set off from the infirmary and marched through the town and onto Duffield. Uh, when they arrived, they lit a fire in a field, listened to speeches, and then marched back to, to Derby singing hymns. So much was it enjoyed that the next day they went and did it again and, uh, and ended up uh, in Spondon this time. The union funds were, were running low and the payments to workers were massively reduced and workers were beginning to return to work. The protest could not last forever. What good is all this arguing and marching, Thomas? With nothing to eat. There's people on the streets eating peelings. Do you want that for your boys? We're worse off now than we were before. Well, in April and May, the locked out workers began to reluctantly return to the mills. So they were forced back uh, for financial reasons. The mill owners demanded compensation and in fact made many of them sign a, a declaration to say that they would not join um, a trade union in the future. It was a straightforward defeat for the trades union. Um, they were beaten completely. Some of the activists uh, were refused uh, entry back into the mills and uh, had a really hard time of it after that. By the middle of April, the Derby Mercury had started reporting on the state of the mills. Things seemed to be returning to normal. But not every worker was given back their job. Can't believe he's gone back. He may not have succeeded this time, but at least the masters know that when we act together, we can make a difference. Aye. Although the silk mill lockout at the time seemed to achieve little, it was a, a turning point in the fight for workers' rights. And over time, um, it's, it's seen as a benchmark for the, the workers uh, uniting to fight for a common cause. One of the factors forcing the workers into submission was that much of the national support for the Derby lockout was being diverted to the plight of the Tolpuddle Martyrs. For many years, the Derby lockout has been commemorated uh, every year in around May Day uh, in Derby by uh, the local trades union council organising a march uh, which takes place uh, running from through the sound centre from the marketplace, uh, goes to the silt mill and uh, back to the marketplace for speeches, etc. It's historic, uh, both for the city 
and for the country as a whole, and, and particularly for the labour movement. The silk mill lockout preceded the toll problematas. Um, it was a dispute uh, taking place with one of the earliest trade unions and one of the earliest possible demonstrations of people realising that they had to stand together or else they would be persecuted separately. It, it means a lot to me. Derby has a lot of labour history. It's the first branch of the engineering union, um, one of the charter towns, it's part of our industrial heritage and it's part of our social heritage. It's part of the, of the fabric of life and it's important not to let these things be forgotten. Many modern protest marches uh, have a direct link back to 1834 and what happened here in Darwin. I think it does still have resonance today. It's a, a commemoration of labour history. Every year we draw out some of the lessons of what is happening today, not just in this country, but across the world. Trades unions in Derby today look back to uh, the lockout as a, a defining moment in, uh, in local trade union history and are very proud of the workers of that time. And of course, uh, they still continue to have the same ideas about protecting their workers and trying to improve their workers' rights. One day, son, things will be better. I promise. Thomas Redfern and his family, like many of the workers involved in the lockout, were unable to find work locally and forced to leave town to find employment. Although the Derby lockout of 1834 was known as the silk mill lockout, um, only a few workers from the mill were actually involved. Um, there were workers uh, jointly together in this workers' protest from many other trades. The use of the silk mill name shows that the, the, the silk mill was iconic um, in Derby then as it is today, the site of the world's first factory, and how that name was used to raise the profile of the lockout and of the rise of the early union movement.